Okay, so uh, I apologize. We're running a little late today. Uh, today is Tuesday, but it's our Monday because we're coming off the holiday. So uh, a lot going on on Mondays and Fridays, busiest days of the week. So let's get started with the uh, shareholder questions. we we'll are ask the uh, CEO um, any question as Candace has coined it. Uh, the first question was, what is my favorite subsidiary? That's that's a funny question. Uh, I don't really have a favorite per se. I might be a little biased towards UAT as I have direct purview over uh, uh, the operations in that company with a lot of exciting things going on in there. But I liken this question to, you know, what is your favorite link in a chain? You know, they're all really important. They all work together um, and they're all integrated in one way or another. So I don't have a particular I know that's a non-answer, and I apologize. Uh, <clears throat> is it required or recommended for any of the subsidiaries to have an ISO or ISO certification? If so, has that certification been accom accomplished? If not, uh, but plan to do it, what is the timeline? So to answer your question, yes, there are um, ISO certification requirements for Clearview. Uh, and also for a few of the other things within the biotech uh, arena. There'll be a few other things in some of the other subsidiaries like Bacter and Nextcast. Uh, do we have those ISO certifications in-house? So what we do for Clearview, let's say, is we will contract that company out that has that, that can also do the sterilization, can do the uh, inventory and meet FDA requirements. It reduces costs and overhead for us. The, the, the cost to us is nominal. Really, it, it works within the, um, uh, the, the structure of the sale price, or we refer to it as COGS, cost of goods and services. So it doesn't really affect margins all that much. Uh, and it saves us a ton of money. In the future, are we gonna do that? The answer is yes because we will have all manufacturing uh, and assembly and certifications and, and um, all of the requirements for sterilization in-house. And then we would deal directly uh, with the FDA on site. We deal directly with the FDA in some of those other devices that we'll be moving forward with, but uh, not directly on our own premises. Uh, what led you to pick the industries you have for UAT Group? Um, this question states that Obviously, there was a need to be filled that I saw, but why those industries and those needs? So that is interesting. So I'm not going to go too far down the road on this because there's some of the things we're working on. But when I look or evaluate a company, I see what tech do they have, what IP do they have, and what do we need? And all of the subsidiaries are uh, had something that we needed. And we also saw that we could bring something to the table for them. I don't do any deals or even consider a transaction that's not a win-win on both sides. I don't believe in that. So we never come in and have these very complicated uh, agreements and documents drafted by clever attorneys. All of our attorneys know that everything has to be very simple, very transparent, and I try to keep the documents uh, to the minimum. I feel that overly complex, many, many page documents are really designed to be deceptive. Uh, that's not what we do here. You, you will realize as we move or progress down the road that I have a very good relationship with all the, the uh, executives within uh, all of the subsidiaries. We work very, very closely and I consider all of them uh, to me more than co-workers. We're all friends and, and we speak on a regular Basis. So we try to make things as friendly as possible uh, to ensure that everyone is getting what they need and that uh, to, to really afford us the, the best opportunity or shot at success. So I, as far as um, synergy with the companies, they have something we need, we have something they need, and we progress in that manner. A good example would be when we moved into moved to acquire Ridge Orthopedics years ago, they had a technology that we were looking at. They were using some materials that we wanted for something over in UAT, uh, more on the defense side. And we acquired them, we brought that in, and we've been working on it ever since. Uh, and they have some other products, Clearview. Um, the uh, the U-Crutch is another one that'll be, we're actually in third generation on that. So that'll be something we're looking forward in the near future. Hope that answers the question. 
what did happen over the last few years? Uh, they've been following this since 2015. There were ups, uh, updates here and there, but it's been hard to, it's difficult to piece together. Can you provide a map of events? So what did happen? So we were, we were quiet. That was intentional. We were putting things in place. We were looking at doing a new vehicle, moving into that vehicle at the exact price per share to do a conversion to make everything as fair as possible. When we were gonna be doing that conversion, we were gonna be paying a premium to existing shareholders uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 20%. That didn't work out because they were unable, uh, the people that were providing the vehicle were unable to provide a fully audited um, SEC filer, which would have saved us some time and expense, right? Obviously that's what we're going through now. And uh, we've had to fall back on a contingency a plan of remaining in UA uh, TG as a publicly traded uh, vehicle or, or security. Uh, while we were waiting, we were putting together all these agreements to acquire companies. We were also working at clearing up some debt uh, issues that we were able to, to address and some capital issues and a few other things that were, I, I don't wanna get too specific into that. Um, we are where we are right now and it's progressed well. As far as going back into a contingency plan, it may have cost us some time, but looking at it now, it was the best decision, even better than the original plan. I think it's worked out quite well. So I, I know that's an oversimplification of what's happened, but there were a lot of things that needed to be in put in place. And all these subsidiaries, I, I developed a relationship, already had a relationship with, and behind the scenes, we were going in and helping them with a few of the things they were working on, working on negotiating of, uh, potential contracts, licensing permits, and a few other things that we were working on with some of the other companies, working with Boost on some of the marketing. If you recall, Hygieia, we did some test marketing when we launched the, the uh, standard athletic uh, short sock or low cut sock. Uh, that was all for purpose. We, we did that to see what, what the demographics were, what kind of return we were gonna get on our investment for, for uh, advertising dollars, and Boost has done incredibly well. Right now in the industry, if you spend a dollar, if you spend uh, for every dollar you spend, you're lucky if you get two back. Boost has exceeded that um, by many fold. So they they really are phenomenal in their, uh, not just in their marketing and their algorithms they work, but their approach to how they do that. So it's been incredible. Um, hopefully that answered uh, that question. Not as detailed as I'm sure someone would like, but I, I, I think that's the best way to describe it. Any plans on a forward split? I'm not sure why we would do that if we were looking to uplist. Um, this does bring about a couple of questions I've gotten in reference to corporate actions or strategic actions, uh, you know, however you want to label them on reverse split, forward split, uh, uh, augmenting the cap structure in any way. Uh, you know, I think I've made my opinion of reverse splits pretty clear. I don't think I could be any clearer. I think they've been misused, overused, abused, uh, and mo mostly for the wrong reasons. And I know it's been said I hate them. I do not hate reverse splits. That's pretty strong. I I'm just not a big supporter of them being as used as frequently. It's, it's supposed to be a tool that is used to advance the company, but also benefit the shareholders. There is a way to do that without, you know, doing a reverse split, Increasing the authorized or leaving the authorized where it is and then issuing doing a mass issuance That's not what the tool was was meant for uh, in my opinion in my opinion So I am not fully against a forward or reverse split But I think what we're going to do is this questions come up several times. I understand why I understand why But we're going to include that in the capital market series I, I want to go over that because I think it's widely misunderstood and and probably for good reason right there are many companies that have abused it it's hurt shareholders and so now it's just labeled as a you know a poison pill or a completely bad thing that's not accurate uh, most people who trade know that but uh, for the most part you know, uh, it is now a forward split there's many reasons you you would do that I don't want to get into that in this video that's not something that I see at this particular point would benefit us so I don't see that as a consideration, but we will get into cap structure, uh, corporate actions, strategy uh, that surrounds specific corporate actions and filings, and why these are 
can be good things, but also potentially bad things. So we will get into that in the series. I have most of that curriculum outlined already. It's been really busy right here, so I'm, I'm, we're moving a little slow on that, but I will get to it and we'll go over all of that in detail. I think that's important um, for everyone to understand. I, and, I, and I'm not looking to insult anyone. I just think most people that, I, that have reached out or have commented on this um, are basing their understanding on a very limited and narrow view. Uh, there's a lot to learn about the capital markets, and there are a lot of ways to get to where you want to be without doing either one of those corporate actions. Uh, I'm not sure why everyone is so focused on this, but anyway, uh, we'll discuss that in the future. What uh, on the plan, okay, what is on the plan for Hygieia Sport cl uh, Clothing? Okay, uh, so where are we at? The plan uh, would be for the holidays, and we just started evaluating inventory amounts and what kind of inventory we really need for the Hygieia HP line. Now, this is under UAT. Uh, the biotech division is the one that produced the uh, Hygieia technology or the antimicrobial technology. And that will be the Hygieia HP line. That will be for both men and women. It will be the low-cut socks. It will be the crew-cut socks for men. And we are working on a no-show sock. So far, I have not been satisfied with the no-show sock quality. Uh, I, mean, I test all of them personally as well as they get sent out to be quality and uh, tested as well as endurance tested and I have not been satisfied to date. We'll get there uh, but we're not going to put something else we're not going to put something out that another company is already doing and it's the same quality same standard it doesn't make any sense. Uh, we should be doing things that are unique. So uh, that's the HP line for socks. Then the men's boxers, that's another, uh, I think we're pretty much set on what that inventory requirement is going to be on the boxers. Um, the sheets, the initial sheets will come out through the Dreaming Company. Uh, they will be the sole retailers of the Hygieia bedding line, as well as uh, the pillow. Uh, that was a something that we wanted to move forward on. I've approved that. So we'll work on the inventory. Is that all going to be out for the holidays? Potentially not. The pillow may be something we uh, push back. I'm not 100% clear on that yet, but we'll we'll get there uh, because there are other things we're working on. Some people already found the, the website for IG Kids or that we have the domain name. So we'll be looking at some, some kid products as well. That's something, I mean, I have children, so I'm sure a lot of you out there do and understand why it's probably a pretty good idea to have uh, children to have the type of clothing. So we'll work on uh, that as well. That's essentially the plan. But I do want to stress one thing. The focus for this year is to get audits done, S1 done, and set up for the New York Stock Exchange. So at any one point, if I feel that something is taking away from that objective, then that we would delay the release of anything. If, that, if, if the production of that, the inventory management and fulfillment of that is going to slow down what we're doing so that we do not get where we need to be by the end of this year, then the decision will be made. And I just want to be clear on that to focus or stay focused on moving towards the uplist. Okay. So let's just be clear on that. Uh, I DM'd and asked him if we could get filled in on the wind turbine. Okay. So okay, just, uh, okay. they want to know about the wind turbine. And grow okay grow organically to New York so wind turbine I don't want to get ahead of any announcements we are going to be making announcements on that I, I think many people already predicted this this is not uh, shocking news I don't think we are going to be moving forward with uh, some of the development and testing on that we will once we get a little further down the road on uh, Novi as well as a few of the other things that we have um, in the pipeline, then we're going to transition that team over to moving forward with Helix. When that's going to be, um, I'm not going to state here. I have a targeted date, and then there will be a press release. Uh, the Helix wind turbine, as well as the Helix power station, are slated uh, for this year to be focused on further development and testing to for its final delivery. So, so for retail into the into the market. So that's something that we are very much focused on, especially when you look at EV charging centers and how we could put a remote 
power station on site. We were, I had several discussions with people on car dealerships, um, and we have approval to put uh, the devices on their sites so that we can charge cars, and there'll be a testing process. This is not going to be something, and I don't want to over, overstate, you know, overstate or oversell something. We're going to be testing this here and there with people that are either shareholders or people that we know we have relationships with, and we are going to be testing uh, on site to make sure that we can meet the requirements to um, have that type of renewable energy on site for electric cars. I think that makes more sense than burning coal to create electricity to charge cars because they're supposed to be better for the environment when you have just burned coal and propane and everything else they used to charge. So I think this is the way to go, and we are going to focus heavily on that the remainder of the year into uh, 2022. Okay, so the um, they want to okay. So this question is about guidance. We've provided guidance. They want to know guidance for 2021. I'm not going to get into guidance for 2021 until after we release Q2. Once we release Q2, uh, as I've mentioned previously, uh, we, we've had to delay the shareholder letter. There's going to be a bunch of things that are in the uh, in the shareholder letter that I think are going to be important. Then we'll uh, put out our guidance and, and what we think that's going to be for the remainder of the year. Uh, as far as um, Oh, a share buyback. I put this in the same category as any other uh, corporate action with, uh, you know, increasing authorized or uh, forward reverse splits or buybacks. Uh, this is something that I would like to do as well as dividends, but that is something that we're going to have to do in the future. But I will address that in the series of the capital markets. We'll put that in that category and we'll go over that in depth. And if there are questions at that time after that video, we'll go over them. Um, oh, this is a question about the shareholder guidance letter. So let me say that. Um, the, the, so the shareholder letter was scheduled to go out. We had a few things that had to happen before that letter went out. We are towards the end of getting everything buttoned up, and the shareholder letter will go out. It'll have to be adjusted. There's some edits that I need to do to it. But it's been completed and approved through legal as well as uh, some of the executive team that gets to take a look at the letter before I issue it. I'm going to have to make some edits, like I said, because some time's passed and there's some other things that we're going to include in that letter now. So um, hopefully that answers your question about the guidance letter. It is coming, though. Uh, it is drafted, and it will be out uh, shortly. Um, okay, so they're talking about market cap. We're not going to get into market cap until my opinion on market cap is I, under I understand how it works, obviously. But we, what we need to do is post our revenues, build our revenues, and then we'll have a, a, a very honest and sobering conversation about market cap. I think you know, I've got a lot of questions about what kind of multiple, multiples do I think the stock will trade at. Um, I, I don't want to get into those forward-looking statements until we establish a baseline. We are, we are building, and even as the stock price indicates and, and many people and even the market liquidity, it's increasing. We've got to let it increase, we've got to let it level off, and then we'll have a very honest, open conversation about, you know, the evaluation of the company, where I think it is and where I think it should be, if it's not exactly where it needs to be, and what I intend to do uh, about fixing that or addressing that issue. So let's, let's wait towards the end of the year and, and get some, um, some things executed and let some numbers come back to us, and then we'll take a look at what you know, what is the market cap of the company? Uh, here's a good question. What makes Hygieia products better, at least different than other skincare lines? You know, I, I, this is very similar to the, to the textile line. The, the, the quality of the materials we use are much higher than even some of these. And I won't mention them, but we have brought in and tested many of the very high end brands and the prices were staggering, uh, at least for me. I couldn't believe people pay that much money for, for skin cream. And the products, and it, really, the materials weren't as high quality as they were advertising. This is part of the reason. We, we did a skincare line to make it attainable and affordable. We included some very high quality products. And then we have a second line that's all organic. Those materials cost more. So I wanted to have, and, and, and Dreaming Company did, I had this conversation with Lake and Press, wanted to have something that didn't exclude 
a large market segment, not, not just because of revenues, but my idea for Hygieia is that it should be everywhere. And I know I'm biased and it, it, it sounds a little self-serving, but there should be no aspect of your life, in my opinion, that Hygieia is not a part of. From light switches, keyboards, paint, door handles, doorbells, it doesn't matter what it is. In my mind, I see Hygieia as a highly scalable product and brand as a whole that can be everywhere. And Hygieia is not just an antimicrobial brand to me. It is a premium, high quality brand that brings forward the, the best possible materials and ingredients for you, the consumer, or in this case, I'm speaking for the shareholders. But I, I think it's important to note that what makes us different is there are no shortcuts. I know it seems like we're pumping out all these products, you know, like it just happens overnight. That's not what's happened. It has been a year and a half just, at, and this is after the, the research has been done and the formulas are created, just to bring them to market. And yes, there's been a, a, a heavy effort into getting them out. They started, you know, they, they were ready to go, as many people noticed during the pandemic when they launched it. I, I've told the story many times when uh, Mr. Cooley came to me and said he wanted to launch in the middle of a pandemic. He said, let's just try one. And he started off, you're going to think I'm crazy, but, and I trust him. And it proved to be a very wise choice because they're, I won't go into specifics, but I can tell you right now, last month was the biggest month with the highest month over percentage. So typically we were averaging 30% or higher a uh, month over in revenue growth. Last month, from April to May, 57% increase in sales. It's phenomenal. Uh, and it's going to continue to grow. We can see we have projected it out. I gave guidance on that. And I think we're going to probably exceed what I originally thought anyway. But I'll stand by the original assessment. So our products are very well thought out. Now, I know some people have brought up, you're changing the packaging. Is it going to be more high end? We are, we are addressing that issue. Uh, and I understand the psychology behind seeing a higher end uh, product in a, in a fancy packaging. And I, and I agree with it. But in order to keep the cost gap down initially, especially launching in a pandemic, I had to, I had to mitigate some risk on the kind of money that was going out the door to bring this forward. And that's the package it, it, it uh, went out in and things will get changed over uh, time uh, now that we see that it's something that's bringing in the returns that we thought it would be. Uh, question about, uh, this is another one about the shareholder letter. I think I addressed that. I'd like to know more about the airspace and what products will be associated with it. So uh, this is actually a good question because I got a question last week in an email asking if we're going to try to compete with some of the other companies that are, uh, you know, building spaceships. That's not what we're doing. So let me just kill that off. The, we're not doing that right now. Uh, is that something that we've considered, we've looked into uh, as far as uh, transportation and so forth? I, I think that's something that we always look as how far can we take something. Where we're at are going to be unmanned aerial vehicles uh, that can support combat operations, but also security operations. I know the question's gonna come, are they gonna be armed? Security operations will not include, uh, I should say, federal law enforcement or private sector security uh, products will not include any type of offensive capabilities. Uh, but obviously, something for the defense sector will. I, I'm not going to get into what those capabilities are. So I, I know people are interested in that, and I apologize, but that, that's just not going to happen. Uh, we've, we have tested several uh, products and capabilities. We are going to continue testing. That'll continue most likely next year. Uh, some of that stuff has to be on a government facility. So we will take a look at doing that when it's uh, ready. Uh, there are a couple things within aerospace that are not just include a product, but also technologies. And that's something that um, we have been working on the whole time. Um, but I won't go into specifics about that. I, I know that is not the answer you want to hear. It just wouldn't be prudent to do so and put certain things at risk. Okay, uh, green tech and battery. So the battery, which is a good segue from the previous question, the battery was originally designed as a technology for directed energy weapons, something that can be charged very quickly, 
expel all of its its energy at, uh, very you know very quickly all at once or instantaneously, but can also be programmed to trickle out over a period of time. That's the power cell. No, in that form, it's not going into the next cast. It's not going into the Novi device. But a version and some of the tech from that development is going in that. And that's why you don't need something that changed the batteries out frequently and everything else. So it's, it's, the battery is very much uh, ready to go. We're going to be making some adjustments to it for, again, some of the other platforms that I previously mentioned. And then, of course, for some other tech that we're looking at uh, supporting outside of the defense sector. Okay, so they want to know what we're going to do. Again, this is more questions with the share structure. We're going to get into that in, in the uh, series that talks about the capital uh, markets. And now, you know, those are the questions we've had as far as the most common ones. The next thing, I'll give you a really quick update. I, I know this is a long video. I apologize. So we are currently uh, scheduling a call with the FDA. We're trying to coordinate all parties so that we can go over some things with the FDA. There were some comments. They have some recommendations on how to field those comments. They've been incredibly helpful. Uh, and we're going to be having getting that executed um, sometime this week. For those who keep saying we're going to have a, an FDA approval, I, I want to address something. An EUA is not an FDA approval. You still have to go through that process, that 510K is what, that, what people are referring to. This is an emergency use authorization. So yes, once we get that, we're going to continue through the process to get the approval. Uh, there's a few other things, and, and just as a cautionary, most of what we have to go through in the EUA is really the process for to get approved. With a few changes and, and, and variations thereof, but the timing is the thing that the EUA really helps you with. How quickly can you get this into the market because it's it's needed, hence emergency use, right? So we'll get that call uh, probably, uh, I don't want to, it'll be this week. Uh, if there's something of significance that I can share with you, we will. Uh, as far as uh, going current, I did speak with OTC. They are heavily backlogged. I stand by the original statement. We were told three to five days. They're going to try to get that done this week, and then we're going to move on. That is not holding up anything else we're doing. We are continuing to move forward with the audits. We are continuing moving forward with structuring all the things we need to structure operationally and then executing on that. So we are there are many things we can do at the same time, and not just one person that works here, and we are moving forward. So... Hygia HP line will be coming out, the bedding line, boxers. Uh, we also have many more things coming out for uh, the Dreaming Company with Hygia Skin and a few other products. Um, Ossifix, Nextcast, Factor, all have things that are uh, in the works that will be coming out. Obviously, we know about some of those. Uh, Boost is still uh, fielding clients. We've scaled back a little bit on Boost because of the time requirement it's very time intensive to service. It's more of a concierge service for marketing, different approach. We are building that team, hiring more people so that we can continue to expand on that uh, business. I got a, a call last week on uh, hiring them. We're, you'd be surprised how many calls they get over there. And there's just no way at this particular point time to take on all of them. So he's very particular over there on what he brings on board. I, and as far as H2O processing, I will give you an update probably later this week. We've made a lot of progress there. Things are moving along. The, the demonstration uh, that took place uh, a week ago went very, very well. And then we'll, we'll give you an update on what the results of that demonstration is. And there's some other things that they're working on over there that are pretty exciting. So I hope this has uh, helped everyone. Got a little bit of an update as a bonus. And I will speak to you on Friday. Hope everybody has a great week. Thank you.